Do you want to be a good leader? The Bible is filled with leadership principles and concepts. And let's be honest, the greatest leader of all is Christ Jesus. And we can go to His Word to learn how to be a good leader. Good morning, this is your wake up call. It's wake up call 101, how to be a good leader. This is the Faith for My Generation podcast. I'm your host, AJ, and I'm glad that you're watching and that you're listening. I wanna go to the book of Nehemiah. I finished up my Bible reading for the year 2023 uh, just a few weeks ago at the time of this recording. It is January the 15th, 2024. And so, in finishing up my reading of 2023, Nehemiah was one of the last books that I read in that year. When I was reading through the book of Nehemiah, and I love the book of Nehemiah, I love the book of Ezra. Nehemiah and Ezra are both men of God, used of by God during the same time that Queen Esther is living. A lot of different things are taking place. There's Daniel's at the toward the end end of his life. He's an older man. Queen Esther. And we see everything that takes place in her life. Nehemiah, Ezra, there's a lot going on. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, they're all contemporaries and being used of by the Lord, bringing back Israel from captivity and restoration in their promised land out of captivity, out of once was Babylonian, then Medio Persia, and back to Israel. And Nehemiah was a mighty, mighty man of God, and he was a good man leader, an excellent leader. And so when I'm reading through the book of Nehemiah, you know, I finished up, I was like, wow, there's, I begin to think about leadership principles. And I believe every single person is called to be a leader. You know, no matter what area you are, um, or rather what season or stage you are in your life, I believe that the Lord can use you and equip you and that if you'll faithfully yield and obey to His Word and His instruction and we live according to the Word, God will put you in a place of leadership wherever you're at. If you're in school, high school, college, you're on the job, in your family, at your church, in a business, uh, you're, you're in the military, I believe that when you'll commit your ways to the Lord and live according to His Word and His instructions, and learn how to be a good leader from His Word, that it will cause you to rise in the ranks wherever you find yourself. And as I was looking through and just kind of surveying through Nehemiah when I finished reading it, I began to just jot down some notes. And I ended up with, and I'm sure there's more, but I ended up with 13 leadership principles. And what I want to do is, this is a little bit different, but I want to just kind of take you a real just skim through Nehemiah and show you these 13 different leadership principles that I learned from the book of Nehemiah on how to be a good leader. The first one is this, passion is necessary. Number one, passion is necessary. You have to carry within yourself a passion for what you are leading. In order to take someone to a place, you have to have a desire to get there yourself. In order to do something well or lead people to do something well, lead a team to do something well, you have to desire to do it well yourself. When leadership fails to have passion, anyone following that leader will do it passionless. And anytime you do something passionless, there's no value to it. There's no drive. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 <clears throat> says this, So it was when I heard these words, Nehemiah's hearing the report of the destruction of Jerusalem, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now you might think, wow, you say passion, but this sounds like sorrow. Understand what I mean when I say passion. I mean your entire spirit soul, which is where your emotions rule and reign in your soul or move from rather, in your body. Nehemiah, when he hears the report of his city that it is destroyed, the walls are crumbled down, the temple's destroyed, it's a wasteland. He doesn't just like, oh, well, that's, that's too bad. That news he hears, it hits his heart and it causes him to, he, he can't stand, he sits down. He weeps and mourns. He's in mourning for several days. And then he enters into a time of prayer with fasting. Every single thing that he 
engages in shows how involved he is in his homeland, in his city, Jerusalem. And you know, for you to be a leader, you have to have a passion for what you're doing. You have to have a passion for where you're going. You have to have a passion for what you're wanting to accomplish. The second leadership principle that I see in the book of Nehemiah is you have to be excellent in your work. When you do whatever you're called to do, and if you'll work the work that's before you right now with excellence, it will open other doors for you. You know, some people get frustrated and they think, I want to advance maybe in a career, maybe at school, maybe on a team, in a job. Maybe you get out of school and you go work your part-time job and you want to advance and maybe be a shift manager or something of that nature. Let me tell you something. The key to having doors of advancement open in your life is to do what you're doing right now really well. You look at Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about that, right? With the parable of the talents. You had one man who had one talent, one man had two, one man had five. The man that had five talents doubled it. The man that had two talents doubled it. The man that had one buried it in the ground, said, you know, I knew you was going to come back and I didn't want to lose it and I just decided to stick it in the ground. And the master says, you wicked and lazy servant, take that one talent and give it to the guy that had five and doubled it. Notice the guy that had five that doubled it ended up with 11. Because what he had, he made it work. He worked and he did it well with what was given to him so that he got even more on top of that. It's no different for you and I. The work that you're working right now, when you do it with excellence, it will open up doors of advancement. Notice this. And, and not only this, it will give you connections. I believe that you'll get divine connections. The book of Colossians tells us, Colossians 3 tells us, do everything unto the glory of God. No matter what you're doing, do it for God's glory, which means it implies you're going to do it with excellence. You're going to do it well. You're going to bring glory to God in your doing. And as you do that, I believe God will set up divine connections for your success on a path of being a good leader. Nehemiah chapter 2 Verse 1 through 6 says this, Now it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of the king Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you were not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. And I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and and its gates are burned with fire. Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long shall your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set a time. Nehemiah, he is the king's cupbearer. This is a high level of of position of trust. Uh, Essentially, and it's not just this, but essentially the cupbearer would be the person that would make sure that the wine that was given to the king wasn't poisoned. But it wasn't just a menial task. After all, think about it. If the guy beside you is handing the cup and you're trusting his judgment whether you'll live or die after you drink, are you going to appoint someone to that position that you trust or that you don't even know? The king knows Nehemiah and he knows him well because he doesn't just you know rule him around like a slave or a servant. He notices he's sad and then inquires, why are you sad? Nehemiah then says, well, how can I not be? I've heard the report of my city, Jerusalem. It's in ruins. And then the king says, so what do you want to do about it? And Nehemiah proposes a plan. He prays to God. And then he says, based on this prayer to the Lord, he said, send me. Let me go. Now think about that. Because Nehemiah was excellent in the work he was doing at that moment, the king's cupbearer. Think about it. 
really, honestly, at the end of the day, a captive, a servant, not in his homeland, not serving a Jewish king, but a Medo-Persian king, a Persian king, right? Serving a Gentile. But even though he was in maybe not the best of situations, he made the best of the situation. And that, if you're going to be a good leader, that's what you have to do. When you're, not the, when you're not in the best of situations, you make the best of that situation. And it put him in a place to where even though he is a servant to the king, the king is actually honoring him and his request. Third leadership principle that I see on how to be a good leader in the book of Nehemiah, you got to take ownership of problems. You, you know, if you're always waiting for someone else to fix the problem, guess what? The problems won't get fixed. You might say, well, it's not my fault or this or that. Who cares? Take ownership of the problem. There's a, there's a gentleman, and he's very popular, Jocko Willink. He's a Navy SEAL commander, retired Navy SEAL commander. He's got a hugely famous podcast, and then he's got his own supplement brands and jiu-jitsu clothing and blue jean. Now that he's making Origin Maine is the company he's partnered with that makes blue jeans and boots in America. He, he's just wildly successful. But what put him in the spotlight was this book that he wrote which I thought I think is called Extreme Ownership. I'm pretty certain, 99.9% .9 confident. It's entitled Extreme Ownership. And basically he teaches leadership principles that he learned in the Navy SEALs, which in those settings literally were life and death. And he would begin to teach and be a, uh, a, a consultant to, to high-level business e executives and staffs and teams and teach them how to make decisions and how to properly run a team and do things that count, you know, when it's necessary to get things done. And his mindset is to take extreme ownership. So when I show up in a situation, all these problems that are going on, it's other people's fault. It's other people's faults. Sure, it's what they didn't do right. Fine. But I'm here. And now I'm taking ownership of the situation. Notice Nehemiah says in verse 5 of what we read, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Nehemiah didn't say, well, would you send someone? Well, would you send this guy or that guy? He said, king, my city's destroyed. Is it Nehemiah's fault? No, it's not his fault. It's because of the sins of his fathers. It's not his fault. And it's because of those that did remain in Jerusalem. They began to intermarry with the other nations and create the race of Samaritans that we see in the New Testament that Jesus interacts with. And they're not keeping up the, anything. They're not trying to restore or rebuild anything. It's all desolate. But is it Nehemiah's fault? No. But does he take ownership? Sure does. You've got to decide. You know what? God's put me in this situation, and maybe I didn't create the problems, but I'm here to fix them. That's how you and I think. As members of the faithful, that's how we show up, regardless of what it may be. When we show up somewhere, we say, you know what? We didn't create the problems, but we're anointed by God to fix them. Let's keep reading in this chapter. There's a couple in this chapter I want you to see. Fourth leadership principle that I see in the book of Nehemiah on how to be a good leader you have to assess projects and tasks yourself. If you're going to do work, you need to put your own eyes on the work project. Don't just, ju don't just rely on other people's information. You need to show up. You need to be in the thick of it. And you need to see what's going on for yourself. Notice what Nehemiah does. So Nehemiah goes to, he goes to Jerusalem. He leaves. He gets the uh, you know, commission from the king to leave and, and take whatever resources or people he needs to. Verse 11, it says this, So I came to Jerusalem, and I was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one which I rode. I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent wall and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal to under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. See, 
Nehemiah, he takes a small group of men and just some animals, I'm assuming horses or camels, whatever they may be riding, mules, donkeys, and just a bare minimum team here. They don't want to make a whole lot of noise right now. They don't know exactly the situation, but he shows up to survey the condition of Jerusalem and the walls around Jerusalem. Notice he didn't just like write letters to someone there. He didn't, and, and obviously he has this connection with the king, and he's in this very high role of influence to the king as the cupbearer. I mean, he's standing beside the king all day. It's, it's not like Nehemiah couldn't have sent someone on, on his behalf, right? The king asked him, what do you want? He could have. Well, send me a team, a hundred men to go find out what it is and come back and then we'll decide. And I'll stay here and in the luxuries of the palace while they go look. No, Nehemiah decided if Jerusalem's going to be fixed, I'm going to be the one to do it. But I also need to see what the work is to be done with my own eyes. And I want to encourage you in that. In order to be a good leader, you've got to be amongst your people. You know, I'm a pastor. And uh, we got, we're so blessed with so many wonderful volunteers in our church that take their ministry call very seriously. And they do it well, and they're prompt, and, and they're good, and, and they want to grow and get better. And I always want to make sure, like, before service starts, I always like to jump around and just make sure people got what they need and just tell them I appreciate them and always just let them know, hey, I'm here if you need something. But I also like just to watch around and see what they're doing and how they're interacting and you know, whether it's in children's classes or sound or audio video team or hosting ministry or praise team or something. I just want to see and look what they're doing and be there. Not just, you know, sit in my office. Oh, service is time. It's time for service. Let me walk out of my office to the sanctuary and then back. No, I need to be in there amongst the people that are laboring with me, alongside me. And any good leader, you're going to be in the thick of things. You need to assess the work and the projects yourself. Don't just sit in some ivory tower and expect. That's not true leadership. I'll sit up here and I'll tell you guys what to do and let me know when it's done. It's not how it works. Fifth leadership principle that I learned from the book of Nehemiah on how to be a good leader. You've got to ignore the haters. <laughs> That's right. You might think Nehemiah had some haters. Boy, did he ever. You have to learn to ignore the mockery of those who have no skin in the game. That's what I wrote down. I like that, actually, when I wrote that down a lot. Because it, that's the people. That are the, that's the type of people that will come and mock you for doing something. The moment you start working and getting things done, people who haven't done anything in their life will come tell you how it's terrible. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. They've never accomplished a thing of worth in their life, but they want to tell you about what you're doing is so, you know, crappy or small or whatever. Don't listen to them. Notice what Nehemiah encountered. Nehemiah 2, 19 and 20. But when Sambalat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us, saying, What is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them, and I said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore his servants will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. There's Nehemiah telling these three guys that are mocking and laughing and making false accusations, lying, you're trying to raise up against the king. Nehemiah is doing, Nehemiah's doing everything he's doing with the blessing of the king. He's not rebelling against the king. They're lying about him. But notice what he says. The God, the God of heaven, he's going to prosper what we're going to do. We're committed ourselves to God, and he's going to prosper us. We're going to get up. We're going to rise and build. We're going to rise and build. But you folks, you can laugh and mock, but guess what? You have no heritage, you have no right, and you have no more memorial in Jerusalem. This is our city. Laugh all you want, but you've got no skin in the game, so I could care less. And you have to learn to do that. That's a muscle that you build. You have to lose the fear of man. If you want to be a good, godly leader, you got to lose the fear of man. Sure, you take opinions. Sure, you receive understanding and wise counsel. But you don't ever need to be in a place where you trade God's opinion for man's. And that's what Nehemiah did. He said, I'm going to do what God's called me to do, commissioned me to do. We'll rise up. We'll build. You guys, you've got no lot in this place. Might as well move along. 
Sixth, the sixth thing that I see. Say that five times fast. The sixth thing. There I go again. The sixth thing I see in the book of Nehemiah as far as leadership principles and how to be a good leader, you have to learn how to divide the workload among teams. Now, this is so essential to being a good leader. A good leader doesn't mean I do everything and people just show up when all the work's done. That's not a good leader. That's just a hard, hard worker poorly managing their energy. And honestly, my nature is to do that. It is not necessarily my nature to divide up tasks and assign them to folks. Because for a couple reasons. You know, for again, instance, the leadership role that I play is as a pastor in my church family. You know, if I see things that need to be done, I just kind of like go and do them. But what that, that eliminates is, one, am I doing something someone else is better at than me? They're called to do it. I'm not. Here I am getting out of my calling to try to take care of tasks that need to be done, honestly do need to be done. But if I do them, I'm not doing what I should do. I'm taking away an opportunity for someone who is called to do it and express themselves in their calling and bring glory to God. They'll do it better than me than I will. But I can get so wrapped up in work that I just see something that needs to be done and I get, and I get in the thick of doing it that I realize I have all this work to be done and there's no way I can finish it all myself. In Nehemiah chapter 3, the entire chapter, I'm not going to read it, the entire chapter is basically a division, a list of dividing up the work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah sets apart all these different families and he gives them each a section of, of the wall of Jerusalem to rebuild. And their sections are actually in front of where they're living, which is interesting too. A good way to divide up the workload is to give work based on where people live or where they thrive, really, where they're best, right? Understand this is where they're physically living, but where you live, the lane you need to stay in, what you're good at, that's what the workload should be divided amongst people in where their strengths are. And if you're going to lead a team, you have to learn how to divide up your workload. You know, those that are watching and listening, uh, some of you have played on sports teams in high school and in college. You know, you've played in different types of sports. All of them are team sports, right? Basketball, football, soccer, uh, hockey, different, different baseball. Unless you're, you know, like listening and you are, well, I say school sports. I mean, you know, if you're doing solo sports of some sort, you know, singles tennis or MMA or something. But team sports, a good team is what it takes to win, you know, the championship. You might have a team with an all-star player, but if the all-star player is like the only thing the team's got going for them, they won't do very well. Because the all-star player is excellent in what he does, but he can't do every task of the team. No, what you need is a good, strong team so that each member is working and doing their share. And when you have a good, strong team, think about it. In that, in that example of team sports, you could actually have a team of not all-stars, but just real solid, good players who work well with each other, and they'll outplay teams that have all-star players every time. The all-star player may make some good plays, but he can't outwork a good team that is doing what they need to do and has their responsibilities properly divided, and they're all pulling their own weight. And Nehemiah takes that to task with these men of Jerusalem of uh, rebuilding the wall. He gives each one of them their own task. The seventh principle of leadership that I see in Nehemiah on how to be a good leader is concerning this team building. Trust is essential to building a team. You have to develop trust as a leader. People won't follow you if they don't trust you. 
It's that simple. If people do not trust you, they will not follow you. The way you know you're a good leader is if someone's following you because it means they trust you. Nehemiah and these men, as they're rebuilding this wall of Jerusalem, they do it in an amazingly fast pace and time frame. 52 days it takes them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But while they're rebuilding the walls, they get threats. So Nehemiah decides to, okay, as we're building, we're also going to have to defend our... It's possible we may have to defend ourselves. So you read in chapter 4 that they actually arm themselves. And it even says, you know, they would take shifts. One man would work while another man would stand guard. And every man had his sword girded to his waist as he's working. But Nehemiah makes this point in Nehemiah 4.19. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. So we're out here working. We're going to have to work and get this wall finished. And while we're doing it, our enemies are looking for an opportunity to stop us because if we build up the walls around Jerusalem, it'll be protected. So let's arm ourselves. But here's the problem. We're all scattered. There's not a whole lot of us, and we're scattered across this long distance. So what are we going to do? Verse 20, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So this team of men who are rebuilding the wall, they trusted Nehemiah, and they trusted one another. Nehemiah obviously had earned their trust, and he had created a culture of trust because these men are working side by side, counting on one another to get the job done of rebuilding the wall. And now they're counting on one another to defend one another if the time comes. And Nehemiah is saying, look, we're stretched out. Wherever you hear the trumpet blast, everybody come running there. Now here's the thing. You're going to have to have a high level of trust for the men around you in that situation because you're going to be working. And you think, well, if something does happen and they blow the trumpet, I sure hope those guys get here quick. Let me get to work. I believe they will. You have to have a high level of trust. Any team that does not have a high level of trust will not function well. When there's an absence of trust in a team, that's when people begin to think negatively towards one another. That's when people begin to make assumptions about their other team members, and the team crumbles. The eighth leadership principle that I see in the book of Nehemiah and how to be a good leader. A good leader doesn't waste time with time wasters. Somebody say amen. A good leader does not waste time with time wasters. No offense, but guess what? There's some people in your life that are time wasters. And every time you give them access to your life and to your time, they're going to waste it. They don't value their time and they don't value your time. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1. Now it happened when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab, the rest of our enemies, heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messages to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Now Sambalat, Geshem, and Tobiah, they're scheming up a way to stop Nehemiah, to destroy him because the wall is finished. The gates have not been hung, so there's still openings in the wall, but the wall itself is rebuilt but they're still trying to do everything they can to stop Nehemiah from rebuilding the ruins of Jerusalem and restoring Jerusalem. They're obviously working inspired by satanic uh, inspiration because Nehemiah is preparing a place for Ezra and other people to come back and bring back the people of Israel from captivity to Jerusalem. But notice what Nehemiah says to Sambalat and Geshem. I'm doing a great work. Why would I leave what I'm doing to come talk to you in the plain of Ono? 
They say, hey, Nehemiah, come join us in the plain of Ono. And Nehemiah says, oh, no. Oh, no. Why would I leave what I'm doing? And in order to be a good... Now, this doesn't mean that you're arrogant or that you're rude or that you don't give people the time of the day. That's not what I'm saying. Value people. But what I am saying is, if you value your time, you will also value other people's time. Which means when you're in front of someone, you're engaging with someone, you make the most of that time. You don't show up late. That's wasting someone else's time. When you show up and you're interacting with someone, make the most of that time. Put the phone away. Engage with that person. And you have to be a very discerning because there are some people that they'll just show up in your life and they'll take you down paths you never want to go and they will waste so much time of your life and they don't value your time. And you have to limit. You have to limit that interaction if you want to be a good leader. And on a team, you have to limit time wasters from your team. The ninth leadership principle I see in the book of Nehemiah on how to be a good leader. A good leader fights for his people even when it cost him something. In Nehemiah chapter 5, Nehemiah hears that the people, the very people in Jerusalem, the Israelite people, the Jewish people, they're enslaving their brethren through debt. That some of these people are so poor that they have sold their sons, their daughters, their lands to these Jewish nobles. And it it makes Nehemiah so upset. Verse 6 says, I became very angry when I heard that outcry in these words. And after serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers. And he tells them, look, guys, we're all the people of God. We're all Jews. We're all Israelites here. We have no right enslaving one another through debt. And the nobles hear Nehemiah and they release all the debts and the lands and the sons and daughters they've taken as servants back to their brethren. And Nehemiah himself made a point. He tells the nobles, he says to these nobles, he says, now's not a time to get rich off your brothers and sisters. He said, here I am. I don't even, I don't even tax the people what I am legally required to tax as a governor appointed by the king of this area. Rather, Nehemiah's providing food and shelter for others. He's not taking from the people there because there, there's so much ruin in there. He's trying to restore something that has been destroyed. Now's not the time for him to profit. And if you're going to be a good leader, you got to fight for your people, even if it costs you something. And Nehemiah said, this is costing me. I'm not, I'm not nowhere. I, I could be living in the luxury of a palace and I could be here exacting a tax, but I'm not going to because I want to see Jerusalem rebuilt. Tenth principle of leadership that I see in the book of Nehemiah and how to be a good leader. If you're going to do anything of value, real people will threaten you with real threats. Just keep working. These guys, Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, they devised this plan and they have a secret informer. His name is Shemaiah. And they send Shemaiah to speak to Nehemiah and say, Look, Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, they're going to come. They're trying to devise a plan to kill you. You should come and hide in the temple with me. I know a great place to hide in the temple. And Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 6.11, Should such a man as I flee... And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. In other words, Nehemiah is saying, look, they may be trying to kill me, but I'm not fleeing. I'm not running. I'm not going to hide. Who would? What kind of man would I be? And I'm certainly not going to defile the temple by just running in there when I'm not able to just go into that secret place and enter into the temple and hide from someone attacking. And thank goodness he did because verse 12 says he perceived that God had not sent him at all, Shemaiah, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Tobiah and Sambalat wanted to get Shemaiah to deceive Nehemiah so Nehemiah would go to the temple so that Sambalat and Tobiah could then use that testimony. He went in the temple and he wasn't supposed to against his own people so they would kick out Nehemiah or stone him to death or whatever kind of judgment that they could conjure up. 
And if you're going to do real work, you'll get real threats. You may have already experienced it. When you're working with real people, sometimes real people really do threaten you. What should you do? Stay the task. Keep working. Keep doing what God's called you to do. The 11th principle in Nehemiah that I see concerning leadership and how to be a good leader, a good leader gives priority to God's word. Nehemiah's rebuilding the walls, but it's not just a physical rebuilding. Once they get to a place, he brings in Ezra, another man that comes from uh, Media Persia, comes from uh, the Persian king that has an opportunity to bring back three waves of Israelites back to Jerusalem. And Ezra comes back to restore and rebuild spiritually. Nehemiah is physically rebuilding Jerusalem. Ezra's mission is to rebuild the people spiritually. But Nehemiah makes a place. 8-1, Nehemiah 8-1, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in the front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Verse 2, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And then he read from it. Ezra comes and he begins to teach from the word of God to all the people there in Jerusalem. And Ezra has men and teachers of the law that help him go through the midst and the multitudes and families of people and individually teach them. Nehemiah made room for the word of God. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter where you're leading. It may be a secular job or in school, whatever. But if you're a leader and you're a follower of Christ, you need to make room for the Word of God. You need to put the Word of God as a priority in your life if you want to be truly a good leader. If you want to lead with wisdom, you've got to make God's Word a priority. When you get revelation and wisdom from His Word, it will empower you as a leader. Twelfth leadership principle that I see, almost finished with this list, in the book of Nehemiah on how to be a good leader, a good leader maintains his God-given vision over the course of time. In Nehemiah chapter 13, the last chapter of Nehemiah, Nehemiah actually has rebuilt all of Jerusalem's walls and Ezra's there rebuilding the people spiritually. Nehemiah goes back to serve the king as the cupbearer for a time and season. And then he asks for a time of leave so that he can go back and check out how things are going. And while he is gone, he finds out Tobiah, this wicked man, and a few other wicked guys have set up shop in the temple. And the priest and the Levites aren't bringing the sacrifices. And people aren't bringing their tithe to the temple to repair the temple. And many different things that are instructed in the law, the people aren't doing according to the law. So Nehemiah leaves for a time. When he comes back, he finds out some things that are taking place shouldn't be taking place. What does he do? Well, I tried. I did my best. I built the walls. I'm out of here. No. He stays the course. Even years later, he stays the course. He runs those guys out of the temple. There's some men that have married other women that are not Israelites against the law. He, he tells them, nope, you're going to have to break off those marriages. He tells the priest, you need to get to work to doing the sacrifices and worship. You need to do exactly what you need to do in the house of the Lord. The people need to bring forth the money to bring into the treasury for the storehouse of the temple. He gets people back into the flow and obeying the law of God. He commits himself to God's call, and even years later, he's still committed to the vision. If you're going to be a good leader, you have to be able to carry a vision, not for a day or for a month, but for your lifetime. When you have an instruction from God, when you're in a place, you carry that vision until it's completed. And the very last, the 13th leadership principle, hope no one's skeptical or, or uh, spooky. I don't believe in 13 being unlucky anyway. But I've got 13 for you. And the last one, the 13th leadership principle I see in the book of Nehemiah on how to be a good leader. And it's completely spiritual based. A good leader is going to have a life of prayer, is going to walk obedient to God's word, and there'll even be times where you're in a time of prayer and fasting. 
we see this in the life of Nehemiah. It's basically every chapter, but I believe two. And the two chapters that it's not, that doesn't mention Nehemiah either praying, praying with fasting, or obeying and instructing God's word. One of those chapters, he's basically listing all the genealogies of the people who came with him. Essentially, every chapter, but one or two in the book of Nehemiah, we see Nehemiah oftentimes praying, getting instruction from the Lord what to do. He prays with fasting, and he's constantly obeying God's word and instructing God's word. And if you want to be a good leader, you're going to have to have a strong prayer life. Sometimes when you don't know what to do or consecrate yourself to the Lord or get, get instruction and direction, Pray with fasting and always obey the Word of God. I'm so thankful that you're watching and listening today and I pray that those 13 leadership principles will be principles that you can take and run with because I believe God's called you to be a leader in your life, in your family, in your school, in your job, wherever you're at, in your church. I believe the God, the God of heaven, our God, our Lord, He has set you up in such a way that He desires you to be a leader and then if you'll take those principles and run with them, you'll be a good leader. And I know that you will because we are the faithful. I'll see you next time. God bless you.